<laughs> okay, so thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be here and uh, to share some thoughts about these ideas of time frequency with you. And tomorrow, I think the discussion will go on in, in another context. And of course, I'm, I'm very happy discussing with people interested in that. So what I would like to do in this uh, lecture is to uh, give some kind of overview about uh, techniques of time frequency analysis. So I will start from basics, because I think it's more or less necessary to speak a little bit about the context and also about the uh, where it comes from and what are the basics and I will try uh, gradually to to give some insight into more recent stuff and, and at the end I would like also if time permits to uh, I would like to talk about more uh, recent advances related to other form of decomposition of signals, which are also related to time frequency analysis, but not necessarily in the sense of what had been done in the last uh, 20 years. So <clears throat> I will start with very general uh, things because I, I think that the time frequency analysis is one example, some kind of emblematic example of what uh, is more or less encountered in many situations where people are interested in uh, applied science, I would say, because we are very often somehow uh, at, at the interplay of different things, like something like physics, for instance, where you are given some laws of nature because phenomena are as they are, or because we are also building some devices which have to obey some laws and we have real world applications. So we have to deal with that and also to get some interpretation. But the thing is that we try to also put some mathematic on that because it's help of, it helps, of course, not only for building models, but also for deriving proofs and, and asserting that what you are doing is something which makes sense in a, in a mathematical sense. And all this cannot really work if you do not have the third uh, component, which is more related to computer science. And, and because very often what you have to do is to also have two algorithms. So in some cases you can have very nice mathematical ideas which are so disconnected with the physical interpretation that it's hard to, to imagine that you can uh, do a real application like this. Or you can have nice connection, I will give an example later, but if you don't have nice ways of making this operational in a, in a concrete application, uh, it might just be forgotten for a while and not be used because of that. And the most successful application are when the three of these components are together. And the most emblematic example of that is precisely the Fourier example. Because if you think of the Fourier situation, you have a starting point which is really physics because it's a question of writing a heat equation. It's also something which has been the pioneering work for a whole branch of mathematics for 200 years uh, in harmonic analysis, which is extremely important. And also, it's something which has uh, great success in, uh, in computer science and in signal processing, and thanks, for instance, to the fast Fourier transform which happened in the mid-60s. Uh, mid and the combination of the three really made the very uh, successful the, the Fourier transform. And so if you go back a little bit, I just show the picture of uh, Fourier. Okay, it's not that good. Because uh, last year, uh, it was exactly 200 years after that uh, Fourier first published uh, this historical memoir for uh, the heat equation. And it was a celebration of, uh, of uh, Fourier. And I just wanted to, to see the... This is uh, the, um, the paper which was uh, signed by uh, people like Lagrange and other ones for the prize of the uh, French Academy of Science for the, this successful memo. And I would like also to, to give two quotations, one which is, I think, well-known, one which is a little bit less well-known, and two references. Because if you uh, look at what Fourier wrote uh, in his historical memoir, you have this celebrated uh, sentence, so maybe you know it. The profound study of nature is the most fertile source of mathematical discovery. And this is really, uh, in terms of what I showed before, the uh, this, this diagonal here, okay. But also he wrote in the conclusion of the memo something which is, uh, I think, very interesting because he said that the proposed method does not leave anything vague and indefinite in solution. It drives them to the ultimate numerical application, necessary condition for any research, and without which we will only end up with useless transformation. 
And so this is really something which close completely the loop of the three uh, components I mentioned before, and which show how uh, Fourier visionary was in terms of uh, science, because he not only solved a physical problem, but also he created a new branch of mathematics, and he managed to make this operational by having some algorithms. So he did not create a fast Fourier transform, but he devised methods for really computing very fast anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's transform. And if you are interested in that, I think the the, the most interesting sources of references, which are these two in French, are the, the book by Dombre and Robert, Fourier, Créateur de la Physique Mathématique, and, and this very interesting uh, paper by Jean-Pierre Kahn, which is available online. If you go to the CNRS site and you go to the mathematics sections, you go to this place, which is Image des Mathématiques, which now is a, a website, and you can find online this, uh, this very, very interesting uh, paper. Okay, so... <clears throat> Let's start with Fourier. So you know that when you, you think of Fourier decomposition, what you are doing is that you are using as element for the decomposition complex exponentials, which means that you have functions like this, which are function of time t and also of frequency f, and which appears in this complex exponential. And what is a Fourier transform? It's just <clears throat> the inner product between the analyzed signal, x, and these complex exponentials, okay? And the good thing is that you can reverse, of course, the transform, because if you now add up all these coefficients with a proper wave function here, you just recover the original signal. So you have a whole scheme of analysis and synthesis, and which have both, uh, <coughs> which have mathematical aspects, physics aspects, and computer aspects. Because what states for it that almost any waveform can be understood as a superimposition of harmonic modes, which unfortunately are just complex exponential, which means that the everlasting modes undamped and fixed frequency. But this has a very important implication in physics because we know that the frequency plays a key role in frequency in uh, physics for anything related to vibration and wave and so on. And computer science had already mentioned that uh, the fast Fourier transform which appeared in the mid 60s really made this uh, uh, very, very successful. So a few words about uh, these uh, uh, this things. What I, when I was talking about the physics of nature and a uh, man-made uh, system, I was mentioning things like this, for instance. If you look at the, uh, where uh, waves, vibrations, and Fourier uh, decomposition may appear in physics, you can go to, from mac macrophysics, where you are interested in uh, celestial mechanics, to microphysics with quantum mechanics. And for instance, you, if you reverse and you go to the physics of engineers, you can also go to all, everything related to model analysis, rotating machinery, surveillance, vibrating structures. And here you have the two analysis and synthesis systems of this kind of things for tides, which had been developed in the in 19th century by Lord Kelvin. And this, I, I won't explain this, but this is a very uh, clever system made of cylinders and, and, uh, and balls on a rotating disk for computing modes of, of, uh, of waveforms in terms of Fourier modes. So when, when you are uh, rotating all this according to the waveform you are interested in, you can extract the coefficients of your Fourier transform mechanically. And this was one of the first devices for, for doing a Fourier decomposition. And uh, the thing that you can reverse that, and you can plug this into a system where you now compose the modes so as to create a more complicated waveform. And this was used for uh, making calendars for the tides by the British in the, in the 19th century. And so this is uh, the system for prediction uh, of tides. And so you play with the, what nature gives you, for instance, with the, the tides, and you, you also do some engineering system. Another thing I would like to mention, because it will come back maybe later, is that another physical interpretation of the Fourier transform is related now to optics, because you know that if you're interested in a system with a lens, you create something which is a Fourier transform, in the Fourier transform plane here, uh, when you are in this, uh, in this plane. And of course, you can do many things like uh, filtering and, and you recompose by the other lens, which is a synthesis system. And so it's not very apparent here, but in this case, you can do some blurring, you can do some deblurring. But the, the thing is that when <coughs> you think about the, the Fourier transform, uh, 
I mentioned, of course, that it's a decomposition by means of complex exponentials, which means that the Fourier transform is a complex valued quantity. And of course, a complex valued quantity is characterized not only in terms of magnitude, but also in terms of phase. And something which is extremely important is a phase information. And of course, the magnitude tells you what are the frequencies which are composing the signal you're interested in, but the phase tells you how they are combined so that they create something in the direct space which has some structure. And of course, as usual, I guess you don't exactly see, do you see this picture? Yeah? So uh, maybe you already know this, uh, this kind of experiments, but if you take the standard uh, Lena picture here and the Fourier transform, and if you reconstruct from the magnitude only of the, of the Fourier transform, you get this, which has almost nothing to do with the original picture. But something which was not that uh, obvious at the beginning, which was observed in the 60s, but not obvious, is that if now you just discard the magnitude and you only keep the phase of the Fourier transform and you invert the Fourier transform, you reconstruct from the phase only, you see that you get something which is a very nice sketch of the, of, of the structure of the image. You see the contours, you see something like uh, the, the main lines. Why? Because in fact, all the information which is in the phase is the way the different oscillations are combined so as to be coherent in some places and incoherent in other places. And so they create the structure. And so everything that I will talk about later in terms of non-stationarity, which is something which tells you that you have a structure which is not the same at some time and at a different time, has a counterpart information in the phase. And this is the case here, and I have another example where you can play the same game, for instance, with two pictures, and you can just combine for the construction by keeping, for instance, here, you take the magnitude of the book and you take the phase of Lena, and you reconstruct something which looks much like Lena. And now if you take the phase of the book and the magnitude of the, of the lady, you, take some, you get something which looks much more like, like the book. So that's really to tell you that the phase information is always something that, let's say, that we are computing a Fourier spectrum very often. We just compute the power spectrum and, okay, it's very important. But really the message is not to ignore the phase because much information is contained in the phase and especially in terms of locations of uh, structures in the original signals. Okay, and finally, another way of um, thinking of uh, Fourier transform here, more an acoustical point of view. This is, a, maybe you know this system, that's a Koenig uh, analyzer, which is based on Helmholtz resonators. And that was a clever way also, no more exactly mechanical, but acoustical to compute a Fourier transform. Because all these Helmholtz resonators, of course, will be matched to specific frequencies, okay? And here, when you have this vibration at the output, there is something like a, a small uh, flame given by some gas, the Bunsen gas, uh, and the, the intensity of the flame will, will be modulated when you will have a resonance in, the, in this. And this will be catched by this mirror, which is a rotating mirror, and this was projected on a wall and you were really seeing the different frequencies appearing in an in a, in, in a acoustical waveform by means of all the different locations. That's something like a spectrogram is, uh, because you have the frequency range which is here and the time range in some sense because just you have the, the time evolution of the thing. And this, this was also one of the way people uh, tried to compute a Fourier transform before uh, we could do that let us say, electronically over computers and, and, and things like this. And it's a little bit closer to music, I would say. So, uh, if, what if you want to, to go beyond Fourier? Why would you uh, go beyond Fourier? If we go back to the definition, I, I told you that uh, you project essentially your signal on complex exponential and you can revert the process. The thing is that these functions complex exponential gives you something which is a spectrum, a function of frequency. But of course, here you just trade uh, time versus frequency. But when you get frequency, you just forget about time. 
So the spectrum you get has no time dependency. And so this is something which is mathematically, of course, very nice, but which is a little bit counterintuitive because if you just think of the uh, everyday experience of the ear and uh, hearing, uh, we are acquainted to uh, frequencies which are always changing with time. So this is one of limitation. The other limitation, of course, is that this localization you can get in a spectrum is for fixed frequencies. Here, F is a fixed quantity. That's not a time varying quantity. Well, again, if you think of something like a, a whistling or something like a chirping of a bird, or something, you might expect something like an instant uh, changing frequency. And the third thing is also that everything is based on harmonic modes, which means that you assume that you have cosines and sines somewhere in the decomposition. And so uh, the idea could be uh, to do a little bit more uh, by uh, uh, very, by, by amending a Fourier transform so that you can accommodate for time dependency in the spectrum, you can accommodate for varying frequencies, and potentially you can accommodate for non-harmonic modes. So this is the three things I would like to discuss uh, a little bit uh, more in the following. So I will start with uh, some detail for how to go from a spectrum to a spectrum with time dependency, and this is really the heart of time frequency analysis. And if time permits, I would like to say some words about varying frequencies and also about non-harmonic modes by means of this more recent decomposition I'm, I mentioned in the introduction. So, uh, basically the program is like this. If you want to do a time frequency analysis, what you want to do is to give a mathematical sense to that. Because here, of course, you recognize something which is parameterized by frequency, and here, of course, you have time. Okay, and so something which the musical score receives some kind of uh, evidence for this notation is not that evident or obvious for, a, for a, a, a precise mathematical sense, and this is what I would like to discuss. So one way, which would be how we can start from a waveform, which is supposed to have some structure, so that we can get by means of you start from the physics in some sense, and here, thanks to the mathematics and the algorithms of computer science, you will get some image of this, uh, of this sound. And of course, you would like also to do the reverse way, so that given some ki this kind of uh, structure, you should be able to recover uh, the waveform. So this is more or less the program of, uh, of, of time frequency analysis. So how first to go uh, to this idea of mathematical notes? The idea, of course, is to, to localize the, the, uh, the modes we have classically in the Fourier transform. And so the, the simplest idea is just to switch to a two-parameter transformation, because in Fourier you just have one parameter, which is the frequency. And now if you add an extra parameter, which will be a parameter of time, you can expect to have a new transform, which would now be a function of two variables, and which, was, which would be ideally invertible exactly the same way, which means that given the coefficients obtained by this projection, when you use these as coefficients for weights for the corresponding waveforms, and if you add up this properly, you should recover the signal. And so the two main classical ways of doing that is first to take for this lambda variable directly the frequency itself, and you go to something which looks like a short time Fourier transform, and just comment about that now. And also you can play another game by thinking more in terms of scales, which might be more related to nodes on logarithmic scales, I would say. And, and in this case, if A is a scaling parameter, then if you, comb you, you combine time and, and scale with this kind of elementary waveform, you go to the wavelet transform. And this is these are mainly the two basic op options for, for, for doing this first type of analysis. And so if we go back to what I explained before, this is another example of a successful merging of these three uh, things. Because if you think of the wavelet transformer, everything started from very physical problems. And it was Morlaix, especially, which was interested in oil exploration by means of uh, vibroseismic techniques. And it turned out that nice mathematics 
could be built on that by means of either continuous Fourier transform or the resolution analysis. I would not discuss all this, but many uh, people in mass built upon that. And of course, what made really the success of the wavelet transform was that there existed associated structures of filter banks and fast algorithms, thanks to all these people. And the combination of the three really made a successful the, uh, the, the boom of the, the wavelet transform, I guess uh, everybody knows. Okay, so this was just to, to see. But now, this was for the good point. What is now for the more restrictive uh, point, again with the same kind of structure, that when you are dealing with two variables, like time and frequency or time and scale, the thing is that you cannot do anything you want. Otherwise, the problem would be solved for uh, long ago. You can do that both from a physical point of view, because this was the basics of the Heisenberg principle relations, let's say, uh, which were coming from the joint measurements of position and momentum, and this was uh, in, in the 20s and the foundation of the quantum mechanics. But this is more profound result from pure mathematics, because that's really something which happens in between any two variables which are related by a Fourier transform. Could be position and momentum, could be time and frequency, could be uh, uh, other variables. And this was formally proved, for instance, by Weyle uh, just after. And the same exactly apply in computer science, because when you specialize to time frequency, then following especially the pioneer work of Gabor in the mid-40s, you cannot do what you, you also have uncertainty principle, which means that you have intrinsic limitation uh, for really localizing in both time and frequency a signal. So what is the simplest way of, of expressing that? The simplest way is just to be to based on something like a variance type measure. And you know that if you do, if you measure what is the essential support of a signal in time and in frequency by a second order moment like this, you know that the product of both is bounded below by something which is strictly positive. Okay, I just have this quotation which just a physical interpretation of this result. And the, the point is that you cannot perfectly localize point-wise a signal in both time and frequency. You can make many variations. You can also look for uh, the minimizer of this. And in most cases, you end up with Gaussian function, which play, plays a, a special role. But if I recall that, it's because I would like immediately make the following comment, which is that it's not because you don't have point-wise localization that you don't have localization. So the basics of uncertainty principle is really for a limitation for pointwise localization. But it does not exclude the idea that as soon as you deal jointly with the two variables, you can have other forms of localization. And one way of, looking, of uh, understanding that is this. You can refine uh, the previous classical Heisenberg uncertainty by adding some term here, which is related to a coupling between what happens in time and what happens in frequency. Because if you differentiate the argument of the complex valued signal, most, more or less you get the form of instantaneous frequency. And geometrically, it just means something like this. If you have a finite volume in both time and frequency, okay, that cannot be compressed, you cannot squeeze more than, more than that, you can decide to squeeze, for instance, in time, that you will do that at the expense of elongating in frequency. Or you can play another game, which is to squeeze in frequency, and then you have to accept to be elongated in time. But if you have two degrees of freedom, like time and frequency, you can imagine to do this, but also to, to do some form of rotations, if you have the good transform. And if you do that, now you can elongate, for instance, in this direction, and then, Provided that you, you maintain this form of minimum volume, you can compress and squeeze in the other direction. And so asymptotically, you can get something which can have some form of localization on lines, for instance, or curves on the time frequency plane. And this is what I mean when I say that you can't have something which is exactly localized on a point, but you can have something which is localized on more geometrical structures, which look like what <coughs> I wanted to, uh, we wanted to have before, which was this idea of instantaneous uh, frequency. And this is not only a 
mathematical views. This is really something that, that can be achieved by explicit uh, time frequency transform. And uh, for doing that, we come back to the uh, short time Fourier transform. And of course, we know that if we just take a short time Fourier transform, it's just a slight modification. Instead of Fourier transforming the whole signal, we Fourier transform the signal as seen through a short time window. And so you can see the window as some form of measurement device, and you get an interaction between what you measure and the way you measure this. Okay? And you have this uh, interplay of the two. And of course, you will, get, you will have a trade-off, because if you think of the, of the windows I showed before, the shorter the window in time, the broader in frequency and conversely. And this can be understood in, understood in terms of resolution, pointwise resolution. And the problem is that if you now want to adapt to specific form of signal, of course, you can adapt to specific form like, for instance, pulses by taking very short windows because you don't care about the spectrum. Or you can adapt to tones because you don't care about time evolution because those tones are supposed to have no time evolution. But now if you want to have something more complicated like a chirp, where frequency is continuously changing, then you are in trouble because you can show that, of course, you have conflict in terms in the resolution, in time, uh, the frequency resolution, because one is controlled by the inverse of the width of the window, which is a classical way of uh, using the, uh, uh, the, the uncertainty, uncertainty principle, and the other way, one is controlled also by the chirp rate. And you, you will not be able, with this kind of transform, to really localize as you would like to, and of course, you can optimize this, but this is functionally dependent of what you are analyzing, so you don't know how to do that. But now, if you go back to this definition, the problem is how to choose this window. And what you can do is to make a very simple remark, which is to say, what do we know from uh, detection theory in signal, uh, in signal processing, for instance? We know that if you know what is a waveform you expect, the best way of detecting this waveform, to adapt to this waveform, is to filter the observation by the waveform itself, which is the theory of match filtering. And the theory of match filtering is very simple because it says that the best way of recognizing in an observation something you are expecting is just to make a correlation with this reference. And the correlation is just a convolution with a signal which has been time reversed. That's just the difference between correlation and convolution. And if you apply this very simple recipe, in this context, you can say, what about choosing for the window something which would be automatically matched to the signal itself and taking for this window precisely the time reverse version of the signal? Okay? And if you do that, you just do the math, it's very easy, and you end up with something which becomes an intrinsic definition of a spectrum, which is a function of time and frequency, and which is the so-called Vigneville distribution. So this is not the way it has been introduced initially, but this is a way of introducing this from this argument of match filtering. And the very good news is that if you do that, you perfectly localize on the straight lines I showed before. And again, it's very easy to show that if you are quadratic here, you get something which is perfectly localized on, on, this, uh, on this line. Okay? And so this is why I said that it's not just a pure mathematical idea that can be turned into an algorithm. The thing is that, of course, when you introduce for the window something which is a function of the signal, in this case the signal itself, you leave the class of linear transforms and you enter the class of quadratic transforms, because now you are a function which is quadratic in, in, in the signal. And this has good and bad, and bad uh, sides. The bad thing, in some sense, is that, of course, you have a quadratic superposition principle. Because you know that if you take the square of a plus b, you do not just get the sum of a square plus b square. You get also some uh, double product, 2 times a times b. And that's exactly the same. If you take a Wigner distribution of a linear combination of two signals, you get the linear combination of the distribution plus an extra term, which is controlled like this. The drawback of this is that it creates some interferences between the components, okay? And this blurs the, rep the, the representation. The good point is that it's because there are these interferences that you create coherency between the components and you can create localization. 
So this is something which is seldom uh, expressed that way, but I think it's very important because, again, you, you, you cannot completely um, forget about the, the uh, interferences without also losing something else. I don't know how you say in English, but in French, this is what we call uh, jeter le bébé avec l'eau du bain. There is this uh, throw out the baby with the, the water of the, the bath. So uh, you have something like this? Yeah. No? Yeah. OK. So uh, <laughs> OK. Or also, uh, avoir le beurre et l'argent du beurre. <laughs> OK. So uh, maybe I will not explain in full detail. But one way of understanding what happens in this, uh, you can build the whole theory of geometrical theory of interference, is to make use of this very, very nice formula which is a formula which comes from the unitarity of the transform, which says that you have some form of holographic construction of this Wigner distribution, because the value at one point in time frequency results from a combination of values which are symmetric uh, around this time frequency point of interest. So when you combine this value, you have this reproducing formula, which is like this. And so that really explains that all the interferences always are in between two components interacting because you can reverse this middle rule in terms of a symmetry and you have oscillation and things like this. So maybe a picture is better for explaining that. So here is the difference between uh, the sum of two Wigner distribution for two localized components and the Wigner of the sum. When you get with the Wigner of the sum, you get the two, extra comp the two components plus an extra term, which is exactly midway in between these two, which oscillates in the perpendicular direction, and the, the oscillation is inversely proportional to this distance. So with two localized components, maybe that's no big deal because you see the two components. But w when you complicate the picture, when you take three of them, okay, you still apply this pairwise. And so now you get more terms, okay? And you see exactly always this, the same rule which applies. And when you add up more and more terms, of course, you get something which is more and more complicated and difficult to interpret. And for instance, here, it's rather difficult to interpret something uh, in terms of all these atoms uh, just from this uh, distribution. You have ways of doing that, but directly from the reading of a picture is very difficult. So you can be tempted to say that you just have to forget about this type of distribution. But now, here, you see that I, I did something which a random distribution of this. So there is no coherency between these different atoms. And when they are added up, OK, you get this picture which has no coherency by itself. But now if you make something much more coherent with this idea of the phase I mentioned before, and the same 16 atoms, rather than just putting them randomly in the plane, I will put them successively on a well-definite line, like this. What happened in this case is that I will progressively construct exactly the localization I was talking about before. Because I told you that when you have a linear chirp, then you have a perfect localization on this line. But finally, what is a linear chirp? It's essentially a succession of different atoms which are localized along this line with the nice phase relationships so that there, there, there is no discontinuity and they are, uh, they are, all, uh, they are all, all combined coherently. And this is this coherency because, of course, Every point here can be seen as a midpoint on every pair of, of components like this with all the frequencies. And you know that when you add at some point all the frequencies, you get a direct distribution. Okay. So this is a geometrical interpretation of the localization for the Wigner distribution, which really tells you that if you want this form of localization, in some sense, you have to accept also the drawback of having more difficult interaction in between different components. But for one component, it's very important because the, the localization is a byproduct of the coherent combination of the, of the, of the subcomponents of this, uh, of this signal. Okay, so I 
talk about uh, this uh, short time Fourier transform and the spectrogram when you square on uh, the Wigner distribution, but what else? Because you can imagine other distribution, and in, if you look at the literature, there are many, many distributions which have been proposed, and there has been a lot of uh, work for uh, having a coherent framework for that, and especially for constructing classes of distribution, uh, so, so that you can not only observe that you have this possible definition, but also you can construct them in a, in a coherent way. And the basic idea is really to say that if you are given a trans uh, signal and you want to associate to this signal a transform, you would like that when you transform this signal in by means of a given transformation here, you get something like the commutativity of this diagram telling you that the distribution of the transform signal is a transform distribution of the signal. Okay, so it makes sense if you think of the theory of linear time invariant filters, for instance, that exactly the way you go from a general, general uh, kernel of a linear operator to a convolutive uh, kernel. That's exactly the same when you add some shift invariance. And the most uh, uh, used class for that is precisely to impose a covariance with shifts you ask the distribution to follow the shifts of a signal in both time and frequency. You want the distribution of a shifted signal to be the shifted distribution of the signal. And if you do that, you reduce the number of degree of freedom of your transforms, and you end up with something which has a nice structure of being something like a two-dimensional correlation, or convolution as you like it, of the Wigner distribution, the basic intrinsic object we see, we've seen before, with some more or less arbitrary kernel, which is controlled by additional properties. Okay, and you can build many things on that, and you can do a lot of variation. You can go to wavelet transform and uh, and so on. I, I won't give you the details, but I just give you a big picture. And because the two the two basic elements I mentioned before are of course members of this class, and if you take the spectrogram, which is the square of the short time Fourier transform, it's nothing but the smoothing of the Wigner distribution of the signal by the Wigner distribution of the window. And this is a very simple result to, to establish, a very important one. I will come back to that. We tell you that first spectrogram is one among the possible uh, distributions of energy in time and frequency. Wigner is another one. And if you think of the way you are imposing, thanks to this Cohen's class, a kernel, a convolutive kernel. You can imagine all the variations which are in between, no smoothing, which is just the Wigner distribution, and a smoothing which is, I would say, the Heisenberg smoothing, because that uh, related to this uh, minimum area, which, is, uh, which applies to this Wigner distribution, by means of any kind of kernels which go in between. And so you have many ways of, of uh, getting something which control the trade-off between time and frequency resolution in the way you are interested in for your given application, and which do not impose you to be too much a Wigner distribution with too many cross terms, or too much a spectrogram with a too uh, bad uh, resolution. Okay, and so if you look at the literature, there are many, many things which have been done, but the basic idea is always the same. You take the Wigner distribution, you go to the Fourier transform domain because that's just the way of transforming a convolution into a product, okay? And in the Fourier transform domain, which is called the ambiguity function domain, you can apply some form of masking, of weighting, everything you want, and then you come back and you do the equivalent of a two-dimensional time frequency smoothing, which improves upon the the readability of the distribution, because it's clear out the number of cross terms, but of course, which is at the expense of some form of localization, because you are not ideally localized as you would like. And the next issue is, how is it possible to do better than this kind of technique, which would mean to have something as much localized as possible as it would be with, let's say, a Wigner distribution if the components were alone, and with as little interference as if we are dealing with a spectrogram in some sense. And so I would just outline two techniques for that, which are a little bit more recent now because this is old stuff. And the first one is a, 
is to take a local approach, which is so-called uh, the reassignment. And I won't discuss this, uh, this global technique because it has uh, some interesting limitation. And for understanding reassignment, maybe you, you know what it is about. Just to come back to what I explained before, because a spectrogram, what is a spectrogram? is a smoothing of a Wigner distribution of the signal by the Wigner distribution of the window. Okay? But smoothing, if you make a mechanical analogy, is as if you were computing by averaging the total mass which is distributed over an area which is typically the Heisenberg area, which is the time frequency surface of, the, of, of your window. Okay? You get one number by this averaging. And what does the spectrogram? It just assign this number, which is supposed to be the total mass, to the geometrical center of the object on which the mass is distributed. And you know, of course, that if your mass is not distributed uniformly, the geometrical center is not meaningful for assigning the total mass. It would be much more meaningful to assign this to the, geometry, to the center of gravity of the object, to the centroid of this object, okay? which is much more representative of the way the mass is distributed over this, uh, this object. And if you are able to compute where is the center of mass, then you can reassign all the values to this center of mass by this kind of trick, and you get what is called this reassigned distribution. And you get the two, beneficial, uh, two be uh, benefits, which are the following. If you take the same signal as before, time, frequency, three components mostly, Wigner distribution, you get the sharp localization on these components. You get this troublesome oscillation you would will, you will like to get rid of, okay? When you go to the spectrogram, what you are doing is that you are convolving everywhere by means of this kind of uh, smoothing uh, kernel, okay? Which means that when you are in the vicinity of an actual component like this, at this point, you'll get a non-zero value just be because in this area, you get non-zero values, okay? And so you have a number which is not zero because when you add up everything in this domain, you get the, the sum of all these components and you assign to this point. So this is not that good because this is what smears the, the distribution. But why is it good? Because when now you go to another location in the plane where you have oscillations, like the ones which are related to the cross terms, interferences, then you get all this compensation of positive and negative value and you get something which is almost zero. And this is good because this is what you want. Okay. So now if you do the trick of the reassigning, here clearly you see that the center of gravity necessarily will be somewhere on this trajectory. And if you know where this center of gravity and you assign all this value to this point, then you will get something which is sharply localized along these trajectories and with no contribution in between. And so this is one, one way of of achieving this first program, which is to get something as localized as possible, and which really comes from a local approach, because everything is at the scale of the short time window here, and with as, many, as little a cross term as possible, okay? And uh, of course, now, how do you compute the uh, centers of gravity? So there are different ways. Uh, where is the information of the center of gravity? It's not in the spectrum itself in the general case because the spectrum itself is just computing with the magnitude of the short time Fourier transform. But when we compute a spectrogram with the magnitude of the short time Fourier transform, we just forget about the phase information. And precisely the phase information is what is encoding this sharp localization. Okay? And if you use in a clever way this phase information, you can get exactly the locations of where to reassign the value, okay? And this was the first proposal. But then we proposed another way of doing that, not using directly the phase information, but using implicitly the phase information by means of the computation of other form of short time Fourier transform with additional windows. So given a short time Fourier transform window, window H, if you compute additional short time Fourier transform with T times the window and the derivative of the window, then 
When you combine this way, you get exactly the same information. And this is efficient. And especially if you take a Gaussian window, you just have to compute one of these two, because the two are proportional. And the cost is just to compute two short time Fourier transform instead of one, as compared to a spectrogram, and you get something as localized as what I showed you before. And you can do the theory for all the distribution of the Cohen's class I mentioned before. Okay? And in some specific cases, you can also do the same with the magnitude of the short time Fourier transform. So if you are in proper spaces of a Gaussian windows, you, you can do reassignment by the magnitude only of the, of the short time Fourier transform. So this is quite interesting. So, so an example of uh, what it gives you and how it some sense gives you something like, that's not exactly a deconvolution, but it's something like this. If you take a model, with a chirp like this, but which is a very short duration, that's really a transient chirp. In this case, if you remember that uh, I told you that uh, short time Fourier transform is basically an interaction between a measured system, which is a signal, and a measurement device, which is a window. Of course, for very short signals, you get both the system and the measurement device, which are of the same order of magnitude. So in some sense, you do not know if it is the window which is analyzing the signal or if it's a signal which is analyzing the window. Because if you go to the Fourier transform domain, you get a multiplication, you get something which is just the same. And this is a result with a conventional spectrogram. Because depending whether you take a short window, a medium window, a large window, you will see something which looks like an elongated ellipse telling you that there is something like a chirping signal, but the orientation of the ellipse will be depending jointly of the chirp rate and of the width of the window. Okay. Whereas if you take the Wigner distribution alone, you don't have this because I told you that you are well localized. So you get the, the right orientation. But you have all the problems of the Wigner distribution. But now if you take this reassigned spectrogram, you see, and you can prove it, that you get something which now is almost independent of the window. And so you get not only a sharp localization, but also with the, an orientation which is now no more dependent on the, on, on the, on the window. Okay. And, okay, this is another ex example. Okay, so some, uh, some example of situation where you can apply this. Of course, you can imagine to apply this to a situation where you have both tones and transients, and you, you can have well-localized uh, different uh, components in frequency. But also, uh, the interest of the uh, reassignment is that reassignment do not really care about where is the structure, either in frequency like a tone, which can be thought of as an horizontal line, or as an impulse, which can be seen as something you, like a vertical line or a chirp. And so this is more or less independent. So you can get a good identification of, uh, of uh, transients and onsets of transients like this, also a good identification of the location of the frequencies. Now you can, of course, get something which is sharply localized for chirping signal, like the one, the one before was already a bad echolocation call. And this is another example where we get here a fundamental plus an harmonic and then some reverberation, okay, uh, so, some echo, uh, and you, you, can, you can get a good description by means of this uh, type of technique. You can go now to the stars, uh, and you can be interested in uh, other domains, and for instance, uh, maybe you know this kind of uh, programs which are called Virgo and LIGO, which are aimed at detecting on Earth gravitational wave by means of giant interferometers. This is near Pisa in Italy. This is a Michelson interferometer. These are the arms of the interferometer, and this is three kilometers. So that's much larger than what you do usually in the lab, but that's exactly the same principle. And the idea is that if a gravitational wave impinges on Earth, because it's extremely tiny within a uh, on Earth, then one way of detecting that will be to measure how space-time is deformed by the, the passing of the wave. And in some sense, this would mean that you will have a differential effect on the two arms of the interferometer. 
you will have contraction in one direction and not in the other one, which means that if you create a fringe pattern here, then you will, you will see some oscillation in the fringe pattern when the wave is coming. And the most promising source of uh, gravitational wave, which is expected by astrophysicists, is something which calls from a binary systems, like for instance two neutron stars, which are coalescing, and at the very end of the process of coalescence, which means that you have system which could be two stars which are ten times each the mass of the sun, and which are rotating at some tens of kilometers, if this means something, and with frequencies which are several hertz, or several tens of hertz, you, you see it can imagine that there's a lot of energy which is radiated, then you can expect something on Earth. And the system, of course, of these coalescing binaries is that the energy which is radiated by the emission of this gravitational wave, which is supposed to be detected by the interferometer, will make the system uh, coalescing because the two, the two stars will be closer and closer. And so, of course, the rotation will be speeded up more and more and in terms of what is measured by the movement of the fringe of the interferometer, you get a chirp where you have the frequency which is increasing and at the end extremely fastly increasing up to the coalescence. And this is what the people are expecting and, and trying to detect are either by time frequency technique like this or by equivalent technique which are again some form of match filtering where you try to recover the, the structure of this evolution of the chirp. Okay, and also this is physics, but also you can find chirps uh, in mathematic function if you want. And if you go to the Riemann function, which is this one, which has been a puzzle for mathematicians for determining whether there are differentiability of at some um, rational points or not, and so on and so forth, it has been proven that when you zoom and you just suppress the trend, you get something which can be expressed as a superposition of chirps. And this is a nice way of uh, representing this, uh, evidencing, I would say, in the Riemann's function, the chirping structure of the, uh, of the, uh, of the function. Okay. So, second approach I would like to, uh, to, uh, to mention, uh, even if, okay, that more modern approach in some sense, we can also think of localization in a different way. Why? Because if you look at the time frequency picture, this is the ideal picture of the uh, reassigned distribution I showed before. Clearly, uh, you have the whole plane which is offered to your signal, and you have only a small number of trajectories which are non-zero. So if you think of the number of non-zero uh, pixels in this big uh, matrix, of course, this number is much smaller as compared to the total number. So if you are n by n, n square, if you have k components, you have typically k times n non-zero coefficients. And so this is sparse. And sparsity is a key word now. And uh, so you can think of looking at uh, this kind of distribution by means of sparsity-based techniques. And one way of doing that is to look at the distribution which would be the sparsest, sparsest uh, in terms of the number of coefficients, you know that this is not really feasible uh, uh, practically, but what has been shown uh, in a recent part by a number of people is that minimizing uh, L1 norm does essentially the same job. So how can we imagine to do that in the, in the present context? But you go back to the interpretation I showed before of the Cohen's class. Cohen's class was a convolution which would be uh, which would be uh, waiting in the Fourier 2D Fourier transform plane. So what we will do, we'll choose a domain which is as close as possible from the origin where is most of the information of the, of the signal. And we try just to look for the distribution which will be of minimum L1 norm, so as to be as sparse as possible, but such that it coincides in terms of Fourier transform with the effective values observed ob 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 in this domain or you can relax by having some approximation. So what is the difference with a classical technique? In a classical technique, you will do the same. So to, be, to just get 
rid of most of the cross term, you have to be sharply localized in, in very few coefficients. But when you invert the Fourier transform, you get a very poor result. Just because the Fourier transform of a localized thing is very spread. Okay? But now you don't do that. You look for the distribution whose minimum L1 norm, whose no, L1 norm is minimum, under the constraint that you, you have the equivalence of the Fourier transform. And so what you are doing with, this, for instance, this toy model, where you have two components, where one here and the other one here. When you compute the Wigner distribution of this transient uh, chirping signal, you get something which gives you a rough idea what is the structure of this chirp and this one, but which is a little bit blurred by all these cross terms. Okay? If you go to the Fourier transform domain, you get this type of thing. Again, you have plenty of information. And you know, because of the geometry I just outlined before, that most of the information which is related to the component themselves is around the origin here. The other things are much more interaction, exactly as for a correlation function. If you had two components, you compute the autocorrelation function of a sum of two components, you get the autocorrelation of the two plus the cross correlations when you when you shift. That's exactly the same in two dimensions, okay? And so if you want to focus on the values which are the most interesting one, you can just look at a small domain here. And you can imagine that when you look at such a small domain as compared to this one, which is a full transform of this, you will lose a lot of information. <coughs> yeah, but you will lose the information you are int not interested in because if now you look, <clears throat> you compute the distribution, which is the one with minimum L1 norm, whose Fourier transform coincides with these values in this domain, then you get this, which is exactly the kind of thing you, you were expecting. So you get something now which really is sparse, because it was assumed to be sparse in, the, in this domain. And if you compute the Fourier transform of this object, you get exactly that on this domain. Okay, so this is another way of, uh, of thinking of uh, uh, localizing sharply small components, and this is a, just a comparison with reassignment, which can be seen as some kind of a benchmark for, the, uh, for localization. Okay, uh, so maybe I will not talk about uh, instantaneous frequencies. I will just, uh, <coughs> how much time do you? Okay, so maybe I, I would like to switch to, uh, to another thing, which is uh, the empirical mode decomposition, because uh, I, I mentioned three points. The one first, which was the, to make uh, frequency analysis time dependent. The second one, which was to give sense to instantaneous frequency. This is what I skipped here. And the third one, which was to think potentially of non-harmonic components in the decomposition, not necessarily based on sines and cosines. And, and <clears throat> there is this... Uh, funny techniques, which has been introduced some time ago now, but not much, which say that if we are interested in signals which are basically oscillations, okay, oscillatory signals, why do not, we not consider uh, this type of signals as typically one slow oscillation plus one fast oscillation? Okay. So this has some kind of a flavor of a wavelet decomposition, because a wavelet decomposition is a filtering into a high pass and a low pass, and then, okay. But here, a little bit different. So how to, to make this operational? How to make uh, a decomposition in, in fast and slow oscillation? And of course, when you get the slow oscillation, you can iterate on this so as to get another slower oscillation, and so on and so forth. So the proposal was to make all the things data-driven and not fixed by a priori filters, like in a wavelet decomposition. And to do the thing as local as possible, but local in a physical sense, because what is locality is the scale of evolution of the signal. And one way of measuring the scale of evolution of an oscillatory signal is to look at what happens in between successive extrema. Okay? And so if you do that, you will have something which is data-driven, because of course it depends on the signal, which will naturally identify some natural scales in the signal and which is not stuck to, uh, to uh, harmonic modes because in between extrema you can have very different things and you can have just oscillations rather than 
than frequencies. And so this was a proposal of uh, this, uh, uh, this so-called empirical mode decomposition, which was done by a guy from NESA, which is called Northern Wang. And the idea is, in fact, to identify the extrema, minima and maxima, from that to deduce some envelopes, lower and, low, and, uh, and upper envelope, to subtract from the original signal so as to get some residual and then to iterate. So there is a subtlety I would just explain because we would like something more because for some further processing, especially for doing some instantaneous frequency analysis afterward, we'd be interested in having something with symmetric envelopes. And so as to guarantee symmetric envelopes, we have to iterate an inner loop here, which is called the sifting process, but it will be clear with the, clear with an example. So let us consider this, this signal. So this is a signal which is uh, made of different components. So just by looking at the signal is not that easy to decide what are the components, how many of them, and what are the time frequency structures of these components. So let us apply the recipe. We identify the local maxima. We compute an envelope as an interpolation, the local minima, an envelope, and we take the mean of these two envelopes, and we get this pink curve. Okay, and so this is a first approximation of what could be the, uh, the, the, the uh, identified uh, mode we are interested in. But now if we subtract this curve to the initial signal, we get something which looks like this, which does not exactly fulfill what we were interested in in terms of symmetry, because we see that here we still have a lot of oscillation, and, and this is not exactly one mode which is in this. And we'd like to, to, to have something which is more, uh, much more simple. So what we do is we take this as a new starting point, and we iterate exactly the same thing until the pink curve will be as zero mean as possible locally. So if we take this residue as a new signal, we get this. Maxima interpolation, minima interpolation, mid value is better. And you get this. And we do the same until we get something which is accepted to be almost zero mean. Okay. And if we do that, then this will be considered as a first mode. So we keep it. We subtract from the original signal. We get now a true residual. And on this residual, we, we go on playing the same game. And then we get another component, and so on and so forth, until there is no component anymore in the signal. And this is not a proof, but you see that, of course, each time what you are doing is that you are playing with maxima and minima and the mean of those. And of course, you will have, because of the symmetry, always a zero crossing in between a maximum and a minimum. And on the average, you will divide it by two, the number of uh, zero crossing from one mode to the other one. At, at some point, you will have no oscillation anymore in your signal, whatever the signal. Okay? And so if you do that, you get... Uh, and, and this is the kind of result you can get on this uh, initial signal. Here is the starting point. Here is the first mode extracted, the second one, and the rest is almost zero. Okay? And of course, you can apply some post-processing of that, and you can apply the whole machinery of time frequency analysis I mentioned before, so as to better understand what is behind this components, extractor component. And if you do that, you see that the global signal was like this, two components. And clearly, this is a situation that cannot be easily uh, disentangled into two components without a specific time varying filter. Because if you just take a bandpass filter, you won't get the, the right separation. You would have to, to do some something much clever like this. But what does this technique of uh, empirical mode decomposition is for the first mode to get this, which is exactly the, the, the upper component, <coughs> the, high, the fast oscillation, and the second component is like this, and then you get nothing. But the interesting point is that because the analysis is local, what makes the difference between a fast and a slow oscillation is not a universal global criterion that's a local criteria, which means that, for instance, if you look here, at this point, this frequency is a fast oscillation as compared to this, to this one. But of course, this frequency can be lower than this frequency of the other component. So 
this is not universally for the whole signal, the fast oscillation, the, the highest frequency in, in the signal, even if it's locally the fast oscillation. Okay? And so this is one of the interests of the technique. But of course, uh, the difficulty that there is no nice mathematical framework for that. And if we go back to what uh, I explained before, uh, we can ask very simple question. And I would like to conclude with this simple example, which is the following. If you consider something which looks like a very basic Fourier decomposition, you take two frequencies, two modes, okay? From a purely mathematical point of view, you can also always express this exactly the same way, like uh, equivalently like this, okay? So for mathematics, there is no difference. From physics, there can be a difference because Depending on what you know in the system, you can decide whether you have two different frequencies which should be independently added up so as to create your signal, or if you rather have something which would be one frequency which has some modulation in amplitude. So this is a model with two unmodulated components, and this is a model with one component modulated in amplitude, and this is a beating effect, in fact. And now if you look at computer science uh, side, when you just apply an algorithm to this kind of observation, an interesting question is that either you have a model and so you can, okay, focus on one aspect and you can decide something which would look like a super resolution for closely spaced components, thing like this, or you just let the algorithm decide because it's data driven if this interpretation is best than this one or not. Okay, and so uh, with the picture again, if I take these two uh, components and I add up these two components, I get this, okay? Now, a little change, I do not change the first component, but I change the second one by taking something which is much closer in terms of, uh, of frequency. So if now I add up, I get this. Clearly, this is different. And from a, from a point of view of interpretation, if I ask you to describe this, most likely you will describe this as one component with a modulation in amplitude, and this one as something which oscillates fast, superimposed to something which oscillates at a slow rate, I guess. Whereas mathematically, you can decide to, to do the, the other way. So for this, we would prefer this interpretation, and for this, we would prefer most likely this one. And what does it mean in terms of these envelopes and things like this? It's just that in this case, by means of the envelope, we really we need two terms because here we get by subtraction something which is not the end of the story. This is not a zero mean quantity locally. Whereas here, nothing to do because you immediately get something which has the zero mean condition. So, now, these are some kind of extreme situation, but what is interesting, is this is one of the cases where you can do some math, and if you take this model, and you look at these two components, two different frequencies and two different amplitude, and you will decide that the F1 is always the, the, the highest frequency, and <clears throat> you want to, this, to compute whether the first mode you will extract by this technique will look like the first component or not, okay? So we can introduce a criterion, which is just a measure of difference between the extracted component and the effective element of the model, <coughs> assuming that you have a, a two-component model. You do not consider a sampling effect, and you can prove very easily that this all only depends on the ratio between the amplitude and the ratio between the frequencies. This could depend on the phase. In this case, we just ignore the phase, okay? And it turns out that you can do something and you can also just look at what is the result. So <clears throat> let us, let's us show a series of simulations which are exactly uh, for uh, qualifying this uh, situation. You have one frequency here, a frequency, fast oscillation, slow oscillation, okay? This is the sum of the two. And in all the diagram, I will here represent the first extracted mode and the residual, okay? And when they are well separated, okay, of course you will get this equivalent to that and this equivalent to that, which means that the criteria will say 
this, there is separation and the measure will be zero and this corresponds to something which is zero for this value of the relative uh, amplitudes and these values of the relative frequencies. And now what I will do is that I will change first the ratio between the frequencies for a situation where the high, the, the largest value of the amplitude is for the fast oscillation. Okay, so I will just climb in this diagram and I will get additional points. So we can see what is changing in the waveforms here, in the construction and in the decomposition. And what happened is that at the beginning we, we just extract exactly uh, the, the components that they'd been uh, added up. But of course at some point they will be too close and we will change and we switch to another regime progressively and we get something here, you, you see that more and more the information is essentially con contained in the first mode with almost nothing in the second one, which means that here the criterion goes to one, which is the no separation case. And you can go, okay, and that's it. Now you can play the same game with a different ratio between the uh, amplitude, where now the largest value of the amplitude is not for the fast oscillation, but for the slow oscillation. And what turns out is that this is really different because in this case, you again get something like this, but you get a difference at another position, okay? And you can also play the same game by fixing the ratio between the frequencies and, and changing the ratio between the amplitude. And what you get is something like this, okay? And at the end, if you do that for all the points in the plane, you get this kind of map, okay? And this kind of map tells you that you have really different zones because everything which is green corresponds to a separation, if everything which is blue corresponds to no separation, and we see that we have drastic non-symmetric behaviors. And you, you can prove a number of things on that. First, that there, there is a, a drastic difference in between the situation where the largest amplitude is for the high frequency or for the low frequency. This is not symmetrical, which makes sense as when you look at the waveform, but this is interesting because it, it, it tells you that there's some kind of independency in all these domains where you have a soft transition here, which looks like a wavelet filter bank, in fact, because when you iterate, you, 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 you obtain the same thing for the half band and so on and so forth. Whereas here you have something which looks much more like a very sharp phase transition, where you switch from one regime to another one. And what I told you that you can prove that there are two specific critical curves which determine the borders of what happened. Here you can, you can decide that you have no separation, here you, that you have separation in between depend on the phase. This is uh, some kind of uh, more fuzzy uh, uh, area. But uh, if you look at this in a more uh, Niagara Falls perspective here, you get something which is really a sh very, very sharp phase transition with this, this exactly the same picture as before, because everything would depend whether you have the high frequency which is dominant or the low frequency which is dependent. So in this case, you have almost no dependency on the relative ratio between the amplitude, whereas here you have a drastic dependency and with this very sharp decomposition. And so in this case, what is uh, interesting is that this separation, which is completely data-driven, because it just comes as an output of, uh, from, uh, from the algorithm, in some sense, n automatically gives something which is a good match with the beating effect, which tells you that when two frequencies become too close, it's better just to understand them as one frequency, which is the mean frequency with some modulation in amplitude, rather than trying to really uh, make a super resolution for decomposing the two. And this could be interesting in terms of uh, first coding because it could be more efficient to uh, code something with just one component rather than two, uh, maybe. And also it could be uh, something interesting in terms of, this is purely a, a question mark and a perspective and this could be of interest to discuss that because uh, it could be related to perspective, to perceptive effect and it could have some maybe some connection with it. 
uh, the hearing process. Okay, so <clears throat> I wanted to, to, to finish with this example because I started with Fourier and now we are 200 years later and, and Fourier is uh, still there everywhere, I would say. And the, the thing is that all the basic ideas which are really uh, in the Fourier memoir are really, really uh, still there in all the new techniques. That, because, of course, all the limitation related to uncertainty and things like this are never, uh, just, not just disappeared. Wavelet transform and not made the, uh, vanishing the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and sp speaking about uh, uh, the Wigner distribution as some limitation and the empirical mode decomposition as well. And I didn't talk about the instantaneous frequency, but the problem is, is the same for instantaneous frequency. So a bunch of Techniques have been proposed for improving upon the Fourier transform, and especially for accommodating with making a spectrum type dependent, making a frequency varying, and making a decomposition depending on the data directly and not necessarily on harmonic modes. But the common denominator of all that is that in most cases, the language for describing this is really a language in terms of jointly considering time and frequency. And time and frequency very often is not that much the ultimate technique for doing things on the, on the signal. Maybe it would be better to do the effective processing in the time domain or in the frequency domain or in another domain. But understanding the structure by means of a time frequency description is generally extremely informative because in some sense it's a natural language for the description of the non-stationary signals, which are the most common signal that, that we observe. Thank you.